We're long overdue and living on borrowed time. The rent should be due for Moscow, Boston, and Copenhagen. It's just that the landlord has been too drunk to show up. This isn't especially common knowledge, but the vast majority, to nearly a ratio of 10 to 1 of the last several million years, has been spent in an ice age. To simplify, caused by slight fluctuations in the sun's orbit, there have been ice ages lasting between 70 and 90,000 years, when the cities mentioned above and solid chunks of the northern hemisphere have been under the ice. In between these countless millennia of ice have been 10,000 year periods of warmth. We've been living in the entirety of civilization as occurred in the latest one of these. The thing is that ours has been surprisingly long. We're operating at around the 14,000th year. We don't know when, but unless some human factor doesn't mitigate it, the next ice age will return in the next couple thousand years. Realistically, it should be here now. This really begs the question, how would history be different if the ice did show up on time? What would the modern world be like if the glaciers came crashing down thousands of years ago when they were meant to? How radically different would history be? What would culture, religion, wars, borders, and demographics be like in this timeline? That is the question of this alternate history. Before we start, the Ice Age has had a profound effect on the world around us. For example, the Great Lakes were dredged up by the glaciers. I was watching an interesting documentary about this called America's Ice Age, which talked about how the Ice Age created the modern North American landscape. For example, Niagara Falls in New York City. On a personal note, I grew up next to a giant rock that the glaciers dropped in Pennsylvania, and it always shocked me that they had gotten that far south. I was able to watch this on Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers that is the richest history content of any streaming service, with content from the ancient world to the present and everything in between. It's also got a variety of content such as current events, science, and folklore. Magellan's compatible with basically any device and is 4K with no additional cost. Click the link in the description to start learning about whatever inspires you today. If we're operating off a 10,000 year time scale, then the last ice age ended 14,000 years ago, with a sort of weird, unexplained fluctuation of the Younger Dryas 13,000 years ago, possibly caused by a comet strike that dragged it out longer. This means that if we're operating off a normal time scale here of the interglacial period of 10,000 years, the next ice age should have started 4,000 years ago or in 2000 BC. So what was the world like in 2000 BC? Agriculture had spread across practically all of Eurasia and much of the Americas, but was rare in most of sub-Saharan Africa and non-existent in Oceania. There were four centers of urban civilization in the world. There was ancient Egypt, where the pyramids were shockingly already 1,000 years old, and the only other state you'd recognize in the Middle East being Babylon. The largest center of civilization in the world was the Harappa of modern Pakistan, and there were a few cities in the coast of Peru with the Norte Chico civilization. Eurasia was in the Bronze Age, with chariot warfare coming in and about to make a decisive splash. There were developed rural cultures basically as advanced as the urban ones mentioned before. Stonehenge, built by the developed megalith building culture, which we know basically nothing about, was already a thousand years old. China was a group of tribal warlords who were scrambling towards literacy and state status, something they'd achieve within the next 300 years, and the world was in the early stages of the massive Indo-European invasions that would wreck a massive region stretching from the British Isles to India. When we look at the possible effects of the ice returning, the main thing to consider is that this would take thousands of years. In fact, it would be a process that would still be occurring as of 2021 or whatever year you're watching this. The ending of our last ice age went from 12,000 BC to 6,000 BC in rough terms, although there were two dramatic climate drops, one a bit before 6,000 BC and the other around 11,000 BC, that lengthened the process by at least 1,000 years. This means that the process of the world freezing would take something in the range of 5,000 years. This brings us to one of the core issues of this timeline. Human history happens in the timescale of decades, centuries, and rarely millennia. For the Sun and Earth, millennia are like half of milliseconds to us. Isolating single natural events will rarely pan out as expected. Imagine predicting an alternate history based off the seasons of your year, operating off the average temperatures. That wouldn't factor in that extra hot July and extra cold October that just happened randomly. Now imagine predicting how the bugs and birds are affected by these seasonal shifts. That's about what predicting this alternate history is like. <laughs> 
All of these things I talk about here should operate with standard errors of thousands of years, but that's not really manageable for human history. For a brief example of how much small climactic changes can affect history, think about the Mini Ice Age. This was when the world saw colder temperatures between 1300 and 1800 in our world. A relatively minor drop in temperatures helped precipitate the Black Death, French Revolution, Irish Potato Famine, European Diaspora, Crisis of the 17th Century, Manchu Conquest of China, and more. Imagine this process on a significantly larger scale. One of the coolest elements of this alternate history is that, like some video game, is that the ice gradually gets worse over recorded history. At the time of the birth of Christ, the glaciers might have just made it onto the Scandinavian mainland, and in 2021, they might be in modern Poland. This adds a very interesting time pressure. I'm just saying, guys, this would make a great mod for a paradox game. Before we hit an ad break, I want to throw my own personal ad in. What If Altist has merch. Buy What If Altist brand maps, t-shirts, mugs, and all sorts of this stuff by clicking the link in the description. The northern regions will be the ones first affected by freezing weather. The peoples furthest north in this era like the Siberian reindeer herders, pre-Indo-European inhabitants of northern Europe and the Inuit, were completely irrelevant and have no records, and so that gives us a certain time buffer. The next peoples to be affected would be the horse tribes of the Eurasian steppe, like the Indo-Europeans and Turks. The cooling of Russia and already cold area had pushed these tribes out. In our timeline, the Indo-Europeans had massive and very pronounced migrations, with huge demographic and genetic effects. For God's sake, the guys committed genocide across northern Europe, meaning that modern British people only share about 10% of their ancestry with the builders of Stonehenge, just 5,000 years ago. Similarly, they came to make up around half of India's genome. With their homeland under increasing amounts of pressure, these migrations would be more pronounced. Perhaps there'd be more massacres in southern Europe and the Middle East, where most people are descended from Anatolian farmers who came with the invention of agriculture. Southern Europe would be more like our timeline's northern Europe in this timeline, with Italians more like Germans, French more like the English, and Turks more like Ukrainians. Similar trends could be seen in India, where the population would be lighter skinned as more Indo-Europeans would massacre the native population. Perhaps areas like Pakistan would be genetically much more similar to modern-day Iran. Nomadic peoples tend to deal with climactic disturbances by becoming more aggressive. This is since they can move their entire society with them and the males are already effectively warriors. Meanwhile, farming peoples tend to collapse into civil war and internal dissension as the farmers get desperate and the ruling elites compete for resources. This would create disturbances in the developed urban societies as the barbarians would be getting more desperate and states weaker. We would likely see the early Chinese state, possibly the Shang at this point, collapse into internal chaos as the Turkic nomads from Mongolia had become more desperate. The Turks would take over China before the Chinese would become numerous enough to assimilate them well, resulting in a hybrid culture between Turkic and Chinese elements developing in China. This would have the most profound effect on Chinese civilization. China is profoundly a farmer civilization, more so than any of the other main Eurasian civilizations, all of which are also heavily founded by herders. This makes a lot of the elements of Chinese civilization clear. Herders are always very militaristic for a variety of reasons, and China's isolationism and pacifism may make more sense with this herder element being weaker. Similarly, Confucianism, China's main ideology, makes sense in farming societies where there are large systems of dependency, rather than the Abrahamic religions which were developed by the Jews, a nomadic herding people. Similarly, China's lack of a hereditary nobility may come from having no militaristic herder group ever installing themselves as one in time immemorial. China in this time wanted to be much like the other Eurasian civilizations in ours, aggressive, monotheistic, and aristocratic. A major issue we run into in this timeline is that predicting events to an exact degree, and by that I mean on the scale of the size of continents in over hundreds of years, becomes practically impossible. We see this with climate change in our current world, in which we really don't know what the effects of global warming will be even 50 years out, let alone the long-term geopolitical significance of them, because the climate itself is such a complicated beast. For example, during our mini ice age, the Middle East experienced crippling droughts that killed millions in the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, in the actual ice age, the region had phases in which it was much wetter than now and much drier. This is talking about ice ages like they're unified things, rather they're complex periods lasting between 70 to 100,000 years with a good deal of variation inside them. What we do know is that the important centers of civilization would experience crippling droughts to their climactic effects at one point or another that would break them and the barbarians would always be waiting to swoop in. Something that people often forget is that civilization in its early stages was quite weak and unstable. A couple bad years of the Nile's flooding caused a dark age in Egypt, and both Egypt and Mesopotamia were very vulnerable to foreign conquest. 
They were always able to assimilate these barbarians, but with some very bad droughts, would these civilizations just fall apart? One must consider how the Nazca, Karal, Olmec, Minoan, Maya, Mississippian, Pueblo, Harappan, Hittite, and Mycenaean civilizations effectively collapsed for mostly internal reasons, leaving only rubble and ruins remaining. Civilization was a fragile thing in its early days, mostly since stuff like city walls, writing, and big palace monuments only benefited a small elite, while the peasantries were mostly indifferent or hostile to the central government. This is why the rise in iron resulted in the rise of barbarism around 1000 BC, since iron negated the advantage of the chariot kings, and once they were gone, there wasn't really a self-interest to keep civilization around. My guess is that the main civilizations would have several hundred year periods where they would just completely lose urbanization. However, there's no way humans would abandon metalworking or farming, and so new civilizations would keep appearing and again and again in different parts of the map. This is effectively what occurred in the pre-Columbian New World, where you saw civilizations continually rise to great heights, and then when the climate got worse would collapse to only reform a thousand or so years later. Much of civilization in this timeline would be like fireflies, flickering beautifully in the dark before becoming extinguished and vanishing again, only to re-emerge somewhere else. The long-term trajectories of civilization may change in several key ways that it's necessary to talk about. Firstly, religion would be enormously different. People would realize that the world was getting colder and resources were shrinking in the long term. If this was a process that would occur for thousands of years, it would just be seen as the norm. Every religious structure on the world would adapt to this. They would inevitably take a very pessimistic view of the world's cosmology. Perhaps there was a war between the good and evil gods and the good gods were losing, but if humans did the right thing, the good gods could eventually win. Perhaps the gods were punishing humans for some sin they had committed in the deep past that they were damned to eternally colder temperatures for? I don't know. Similarly, ethical systems would be a lot more fluid and brutal. This is a world with a scary amount of genocide and ethnic conflict. This would mean that the notion of a united human identity would probably be a lot weaker. Religions in this world would not say, we all have souls, or the light of God is in all of us. Instead, identity would be based around your tribe and everyone else would be some shade of subhuman, that it would be okay to kill if the survival of the tribe demanded it. We have to remember that people in this world would have grown accustomed to the world continually getting colder in the longer run, so they would have figured out cultural institutions to maximize their own success in that world. We'd effectively see Darwinian selection of the societies that were best adapted to the changing climate and the growing ice. Technological progress is a more mixed bag. Some technologies, namely this stuff like military technology, metalworking, etc., would thrive from the extra competition, which this world would have plenty of. You have to remember, in the ancient world, barbarians did as much inventing as the civilized nations. However, other technologies require large civilizations and the narrow networks of expertise that develop with them. In general, more technologies fit into the latter category, and so with urban civilization taking a brutal hit, technology would be less advanced. The gradual lowering of sea level would have some very interesting effects. Over time, it would mean the formation of new islands, and islands in the modern world would gradually over time become parts of the mainland. Japan, Sicily, and Britain are prime examples of this. The banks of Newfoundland would become a massive island chain, which would make transatlantic travel significantly easier. Similarly, the Atlantic would gradually become a massive ice wall, which would make navigation easier as ancient mariners could just hug the iceberg. Perhaps this would allow some pseudo-Viking-like people to cross the Atlantic earlier and with more ease. Also, remember the Pacific would be easier to cross with a landmass connecting Asia to North America. Once civilizations got past a certain threshold of size, they became much more stable. This was since they became large enough that even if one kingdom collapsed, there were enough eggs on different baskets so that the whole civilization could survive. It seems probable that at least one main civilization would reach this threshold and then be able to continually adapt to the growing ice. If I had to place a bet on anyone, it would be China. China is naturally geographically isolated, and as the ice would get worse, the Mongolian steppe in Japan would become more and more inhabitable, thus removing their main competitors. Similarly, China is the main civilization that can continually conquer and expand south without facing either the Indian Ocean or the Sahara Desert, meaning China could continually conquer its way into Southeast Asia. In this world, a more militarized Chinese civilization would control the entirety of Southeast Asia, possibly even expanding into Australia. In Europe, civilization would gradually be squeezed into Italy, Spain, and the Balkans, who would end up having climates similar to Northern Europe. These areas would face permanent invasions from further north in Europe, which would continually be getting colder, 
This would result in these areas becoming distillations of all of Europe, as Celts, Germans, Slavs, etc. would all get squeezed together into these areas. These societies would remain unstable by all this conflict, but they'd also be selecting for the best fighters, who would be the only ones who could survive. This would open up this area for empire building after a certain point. The New World would actually benefit enormously from this timeline in several ways. This would mainly be since as sea levels would be lower, the Bering Strait between Siberia and Alaska would open up before Canada would be completely closed off with glaciers. This would allow the reintroduction of animals like the horse and cow into the New World. Domesticated animals gave the Old World a decisive advantage over the New in meat, muscle, and disease categories, and so on paper with them the New World civilizations would be just as developed as the Old. A variable to consider is that civilization in the Old World was held back for 5,000 years after the invention of agriculture, as humans had to gain immunities from the diseases they got from domesticated animals. Although the New World already had civilization in 2000 BC, and so I don't think it would permanently go away, this is a factor to still consider that would retard the New World's civilizations behind the Old. In most Ice Ages, the American Southwest was wetter, which would make areas like Texas and New Mexico ideal for civilization. However, these areas would also be facing the southward movement of the Great Plains horse tribes without any real geographic barriers, and so that would probably crush them. In general, this timeline gets pretty hard to predict past a certain range since A, the point of departure is so long ago that the facts are already pretty bad and the era we're talking about covers thousands of years, and B, the effects of climate change in this scale are impossible to predict. This is why I've generally kept away from the Middle East, since I don't know if it would be drier or wetter. If I had to guess what the world would look like, it would probably be something like this. What a feltist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon, like these wonderful patrons in front of you. If you subscribe to my Patreon, you get the first 11 chapters of the history of the world that I'm currently writing, alongside all sorts of cool maps, the first three chapters of the cultural history of America I'm writing, as well as exclusive patron-only videos where I'll answer whatever alternate history what-if question you throw at me. Well, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.